if there's one thing that the Titans love more than committing war crimes, it's making all of their stuff as modular as possible. Whether it's their mobile suits or the weapons those mobile suits will be using. So today, let's have a look at one of those modular weapons, or as the Titans called it, a system weapon. Not to be confused with a weapon system. The idea behind the system weapon concept is that a single core weapon could fulfill a number of different tasks by either changing out or adding various parts to that weapon. And this wasn't a new thing. It's said that this idea dates well back to the Middle Ages, with one of the earliest examples being the German MG34. By changing the bipod to a tripod, it would change roles from a light machine gun to a medium machine gun. And it would also allow for better and heavier optics to be installed on the gun. During the One Year War then, we would see some system weapons, but it wouldn't be until the Titans and their TR plan that we really got to see a system weapon in full force. The idea behind this TR plan was to make a next generation flagship mobile suit that could have its equipment switched out to fit with almost every conceivable mission. And part of this package was in of course also its weapon. Based on the legendary RX-78-2's BOA XBR M17907G beam rifle, the main weapon of this plan was the BOA XBR M86C2 beam rifle. Or during development and testing, it was also called the next generation flagship beam rifle. It kept the general shape and idea of the M79, but it got some important upgrades. It was upgunned from 1.9 to 2.6 megawatts, and it got the brand new EPAC technology. The M79 was revolutionary for pioneering the use of ECAP technology, which allowed a mobile suit's beam rifle to pack the firepower of a battleship's main cannon. And it also had enough ammo to make it usable in real combat. There was only one real downside. The E-cap was built into the beam rifle itself, and the only way to recharge it was to head back to base and hook it up to a recharging station. So once your 12 to 15 shots were up, the M79 was dead weight for the rest of the battle. The E-pack, on the other hand, took that design of the E-cap and turned it into a quickly changeable magazine. So recharging the M86 was quite literally just as fast as reloading. The spare E-packs could be stored on the shield, the side skirts, the arms, or wherever else you could find space for them, and they could then be hooked up to the beam rifle in a variety of ways. The two most common configurations were either a single or double E-pack, but there were also plans for a revolver-style 6 e pack system. It's not known if this concept ever saw combat, or if it was even built in the first place, because so far, the only thing we have to go off is this concept art. It does sound pretty wild though, like just imagine how much beam brrt you could give to a Hazel that also had these sub-arms equipped and the performance could be even further enhanced by various simple attachments, and also a lot of not-so-simple attachments. First up, we had an underslung grenade launcher that was developed as part of their plan for the next-generation flagship mobile suit. It was tested out by the Hazel Kelderick, and is also known to have been used by the refined Barzam, but not the planned next-generation flagship mobile suit. It's shaped like a Hyper Bazooka, and it comes with a magazine carrying multiple grenades. The second attachment then was a high-performance sensor. Technically, this could be used with the stock M86 for increased accuracy, but there are no records of it ever being used in this configuration. It already came with a pretty good sensor built in, so there was probably little use for an added sensor, that realistically would only weigh the weapon down for only a very small benefit. Another potential use for the sensor was reconnaissance. But again, we have no records of it being used in this way on the M86. We'll get to the configurations that do use this sensor later on in the video. 
The M86 would also be produced under the model number Blash XBR M86B and would be most famously used by the Gundam Mark II, which is also how it ended up in the hands of Anaheim Electronics, who would make an almost identical copy of the M86 with the model number AEBR XBR 87C. But we're not here to talk about Anaheim's variants, so back to the Titans. One of their main stated goals was of course patrolling the colonies for any anti-federation activities, so they wanted a small and compact beam rifle that would be very usable in these confined conditions, like for example the interior of a colony or an enemy base. This then led to the development of the XBR M84A, or as you could also call it, an M86 without the barrel. The M84 would be extensively used by the Jim Quell and the Hazels, and it would typically use the double E pack. And we also have this one picture of it using the high performance sensor. Our next variant then is the Beam Sniper Rifle that was mainly used by the Jim Sniper 3. Its most basic configuration uses the M84 as a base, with a longer barrel for better beam convergence and range, and a beefier stock. This heft was not only there to balance the rifle, but it also contained systems that would amplify the power of the beams. This weapon could then be even further enhanced by attaching the high performance sensor and the standard Federation bipod. This sniper rifle would then be further developed into the long blade rifle, here referred to as the long heat barrel. The barrel is made even longer, and instead of a bipod, a heat blade runs across the entire barrel, giving it both long range capabilities and close range capabilities. And thanks to the length of the barrel and consequently the heat blade, you could pretty much classify this thing as a spear. The stock then again serves to amplify the power of the beams, but this time it also has a few extra tricks up its sleeve. The stock can be connected to the shoulder armor to not just make it more stable when firing, but also to directly supply it with energy from the mobile suit's reactor. This weapon was mainly used by the Frutidu and would later on be upgraded to the enhanced model by adding an extra shroud to the barrel. This no doubt enhanced its destructive firepower even more, but at the cost of no longer being able to use the heat blade. Our next weapon then is the Beam Launcher, a very powerful beam cannon that is again created by adding both a new barrel and a new stock to the M84. But here, the little beam rifle is almost completely covered by add-on parts. It's so big in fact that it's designed to be folded in half when being transported. And it comes with a sub-barrel that could still be used in this stored state. Of course, a giant weapon like this was meant to be used by equally large machines, like for example the Rosette TR4 Dandelion and the Gundam TR1 Hazel with the Icarus unit. Although for the latter, I question how good of an idea it really is to equip a mobile suit that is designed to achieve atmospheric flight through mostly raw thrust alone with a giant beam cannon. I guess this is the test configuration we have to thank for the viral and significantly smaller weapons. Also, to really drive home the compatibility of the system weapon, the barrel would also be used on the custom beam rifle that was used by the Barzam high mobility type Vervain. It also had the standard issue bipod, the high performance sensor, double E packs, and even a super napalm pod. But why just have a big cannon when you can have an even bigger cannon? Designed for the TRS Hazel Rare, this beefed up version added an extra shroud to the barrel with powerful cooling systems that allowed for rapid fire. And to power this rapid fire, the gun came with two systems. When used by a mobile suit with the bellows frame, like the Hazel Rare, it could be directly connected to the generator of that mobile suit, something that increased the power of those shots to be comparable to the shots fired by the Mega Bazooka Launcher. So just imagine the Mega Bazooka Launcher for a second and think of it rapid firing. 
And secondly, we have this concept art of that previously mentioned 6 e pack revolver being attached to the rifle. Again, we don't have any indications that it was ever used in this configuration yet, but it could be that this was the intended configuration for the Hazel Herrera. A mobile suit that has been mentioned quite a few times, but it still doesn't have its own line art yet. Nor do we know all that much about it, so maybe one day. And on top of that, it also came packed with other attachments. On the front, it had the standard issue Federation bipod, it had the powerful extra sensor, and instead of that 6 e pack revolver, it could also mount other optional equipment like bazookas and grenade launchers. You know, just in case a rapid firing mega bazooka launcher just isn't enough. And in case you're wondering, yes, it can straight up mount a full hyper bazooka. Here's a picture of it with the Hyzak Icarus unit. Because nothing says I'm a mobile suit designed to fly like a giant beam cannon that also has an underslung bazooka. I think what it really needs is a second one. And another unit that is seen with this giant rifle is the advanced Marasai, which would in turn be bulked up with the Daedalus flight unit and later on the grand unit hovering equipment. Near the end of the war then, tests were also being carried out for an advanced version of the M84 that could be used for standard issue mass production mobile suits. The test site was their top secret SSD satellite base, but before the rifle could really go anywhere, it was captured by Yeug and the war came to a close. Some testing did resume with the Barzams that they also captured there, but initially nothing too much came of it. Later though, the rifle would again be dusted off and tested out with Jagans. The rifle was positively received and after a round of refinements and simplifications, it was pushed into service as the standard rifle for the Jagan A type and the Jagan B type. And this really showed just how solid both the M84 and the M86 were, as well as how influential the tests carried out by the Titans test team were. Even decades later, derivatives were still being used on the front lines. And that is all that we know about the Titans' system weapon. So far, because knowing how much they like modularity, I wouldn't be surprised if we get another update like a week after this video goes live. But I'll be sure to let you all know if that happens, so why not consider a like and a subscribe to stay updated. As always, a big thank you to the Patreon supporters, I hope everyone watching has a great day, and I'll see you all next time.